Hello everybody, it's Samantha and I'm back with part two of the story of my back surgery. I took a while until I filmed the second part, so that's why I probably look a lot different. My hair is probably a lot longer. So I'm just going to get right into it because my baby's asleep and I want to make sure I finish it this time. Okay, so I think I left off on my last video at like my first night in the hospital. The night nurse that night was amazing. Her name was Samantha and she got me everything that I needed and she was super nice. And I think she was the best nurse that I had at that hospital. The pain after the surgery was really, really intense. The pain before the surgery was also super intense, which was the reason for the surgery. Um, but it had just been so many days of feeling so bad and the surgery definitely like irritated stuff that made it more painful. The, the thing that was helping me the most was this drug called Tordal and it was basically like an anti-inflammatory thing and that would always work but you could always tell when it would start to run out because I would start getting in so much pain and then they would try to give me oxycodone but the oxycodone would not work. It did absolutely nothing at all. I didn't feel any different and I just kept feeling the same amount of pain. And so I basically, whenever I needed something, I would just ask for more Toradol. But the problem was is that they wanted to get me completely off of that because first of all, it's an IV thing. So I couldn't like take it home with me. And second of all, they didn't want me to take any sort of anti-inflammatory thing because that can like mess up the progress of your back healing. So I couldn't take like Advil or stuff like that. And that was really hard because the main problem was inflammation and stuff. And that was those kinds of medicines were the medicines that were helping me. If you watched my last video, you might remember I said that I was sharing a room with a sweet old lady, that's what the guy downstairs called her, who had had a stroke. Look, I'm not saying that she isn't sweet, because she could be, but um, I don't think I really saw that side of her. I saw this lady who was very loud, very confused, makes sense because she just had a stroke and she would yell all night long. We didn't get any sleep because she was always yelling. Every like 30 minutes to an hour and a half or so, she would wake up and she would yell, help somebody, I need a person, I need a live person. And then she would call her call bell and the nurse would be like, we're coming in soon. And then they would take to come forever to come in and the entire time while she was waiting for the nurse to come in, she would just still keep yelling. She'd be like, help, help, I need somebody. I need a person, I need a live person. And then she would use all of this bad language too um, that I'm not going to repeat. These nurses were probably like, we can't go in there every time she rings the call bell because she doesn't really want anything. All she really wants is to talk to somebody. And like sometimes she'd be like, this hurts. And they would be like, okay, well, we can't do anything about that. And so it was really hard to listen to because I felt bad for her. But also I felt bad for me because I wasn't getting any kind of sleep at all. And then when the nurses would come in and talk to me, they'd be like, they'd be like, hello, Samantha. And then they'd like help me with stuff and whatever. And then with all the nurses coming into my room and helping me, this lady learned my name. And so she would yell out my name then in the middle of the night. She'd be like, Samantha, come help me. Help me, please. Meanwhile, I'm like glued to the bed. I've got a catheter still and I can't move even if I wanted to, right? And I'm just staying silent because I'm like, I can't help this lady and I am in so much pain that even trying to speak to her will just like be too hard right now. But I want you to like understand that I know that this person was probably having a really hard time, but it made my life so hard to have to constantly wake up like sometimes just after right after falling asleep and then I would wake up and then hear more yelling and screaming and bad language 
while I'm in that amount of pain. So trying to relax when you're in that amount of pain is something that I found to be really difficult, but something that is super necessary because when you're in a lot of pain, the medicines like can't even help you all the way, can't even take all the pain away. So what you have to do is try your hardest to just relax as much as possible to try to get the pain to feel better. But that is absolutely impossible when there is somebody screaming like right next to you like in the room right next to me because there was only like a curtain separating us and then another thing that happened was the next morning like really early in the morning got no sleep at all all night i noticed that i felt like i had to pee really bad which made no sense because i had a catheter in and i don't really know how catheters work because i didn't need them for anything else but i was just really confused i was like why do i need to pee so bad but like Maybe I just need to relax and try to let my body try to pee and my body's not understanding that it can pee. Um, but that didn't work. And so then I called the nurse in and she was like, oh, it just like got stuck. It got like pinched. So she needed to like let it out. And I think this was the same night nurse who was amazing. Um, she just helped me fix that and emptied my whole bladder. Um, then in the morning they had to take the catheter out and they had to make sure that I could pee. So that went fine. Um, apparently women do better getting catheters taken out than men do and I didn't really have any sort of pain or any sort of problem but maybe that was just because I was in so much other pain that the pain of getting the catheter out didn't make any sort of difference. Um, and then I had to get out of the bed and they had this little um, bedside toilet that they put like across the room that I had to go use and because the bathroom was just farther away like it was still like technically in the room but there was kind of like this little hallway to get to it and this bedside thing was higher up so I wouldn't have had to bend down as far and get myself down because that was something that was really hard for me was like sitting too far down because the pain was in my back so it was like when I would sit it would put all this pressure down on my tailbone if that makes sense because like this part like say like say this is your spine and like part of it is unstable so it was like this so it was like pushing down like whenever I would try to sit it would like push down like into my tailbone if that makes sense like that's kind of what it felt like to me I don't know if that's like accurately what was happening but that's what it would feel like it would feel like I would have all this pressure pushed down and it would hurt really bad and even though it was higher up in my back it was still in the lumbar spine so still in the, like the lower back but the pain felt like it was way lower than where the surgery was if that makes sense I think because like if there was like a problem here, it was like putting pressure down farther. I, if that makes sense. I don't really know if that makes sense. So getting out of bed was hard, um, but I did it. And since I was in so much pain before the surgery, I kind of knew some tricks on how to get out of the bed. Plus the hospital bed was nice because it had controls. So you could like move it up and down. And that just helped me because I was used to doing it at home without any kind of bed controls or anything. And I was able to pee successfully and it was fine. I had no problem. Um, and then my doctor came and visited me and she was like, yeah, the surgery went really well. And while she was visiting, the lady behind the curtain start was yelling again. She was having one of her like yelling, screaming things. And the doctor was like, what's going on with her? And I was like, yeah, this has basically just been nonstop. And she was like, that's really hard. Like what, like, is she going to be going home soon? And I was like, I have no idea. I was just told that the hospital doesn't have enough room and we need to share a room. And she was like, yeah, okay, makes sense. The occupational therapist came in. The occupational therapist is basically just trying to make sure that I can do everyday things like, um, like get in and out of the bed, use the bathroom and like put on pants and stuff. And so we were just like doing things like that. I don't really remember much about that, honestly, but it went fine. And I basically had to prove that I could do these things in order to leave the hospital. And I wanted to leave the hospital so bad, I can't even tell you because the hospital bed was so uncomfortable to me 
that I just wanted my bed at home, but I was still on like IV stuff. And so I knew I couldn't go home because I was still dependent on medications they were giving me through my IV. Family came and visited me, which was kind of really hard because I saw my baby again and I loved to see her, but she definitely was like noticing that I was in pain and something was wrong and, and my family said that she had had a really rough night. She was refusing to drink anything out of a bottle, like even the frozen breast milk, like she wouldn't drink formula, but she also wouldn't drink the breast milk. And um, they were basically just giving her like solids, even though she was like only eight months old, so she could eat solids, like that was fine. But that she still needs, like at eight, an eighth month, an eight month old still needs a lot of breast milk or formula and she just like wasn't drinking any of that. So that was worrying and then she came in and I thought that I, my breast milk still wasn't good. And so I tried to give her the bottle of the frozen breast milk to see if she would drink it from me. But since she was with me, she just wanted to breastfeed normally. And so then somebody went out and asked the nurse and they were like, oh, I think you can actually breastfeed now. Like all the medicines we're giving me are, are fine for breastfeeding. And so that was great. So I was able to breastfeed her and she got happy for a little while and that made me feel happy that she was actually getting something. And that meant that while she wasn't there, I was now able to pump and stop dumping the breast milk and actually save it for a later date. So um, while I was breastfeeding, the physical therapist came in because I also needed to pass physical therapy accomplishments in order to leave the hospital. Things that they were gonna work on were like going up and down stairs and like getting in and out of a car and just like walking certain distances, I think. I, I think those were all the things that I needed to do. There might've been another, oh, like getting, sitting and standing up was another thing. Um, but she came in while I was breastfeeding, so she was like, oh, I'll come back later. And she never came back that day, though. And so I was like, oh, I wonder why she never came back. Like, I wanted to start working on that stuff because I knew I had to pass all of these things before I was able to leave the hospital. Then I was just in all of this pain. I was felt like I was being tortured by this lady in the other room. Like, because I'm not someone that can handle sounds. Like, I'm one of those people that doesn't listen to music in the car as long as I'm alone um, and everyone thinks it's weird, but when I'm alone, I don't like to listen to anything. I like to just have everything be silent because I like to be able to think and music or any other noise is awful. So as you can imagine, having somebody screaming constantly right next to you in the same room would be very hard for anybody, I think. But I think for me specifically, it might have been even harder because I'm a kind of person that doesn't like noises and can't concentrate with noises. And you need a lot of concentration. And I think that you might not understand this if you haven't been in a severe amount of pain, but when you're in a severe amount of pain, it takes a lot of concentration um, to just be able to function and to try to calm yourself down. So all of those things combined, it actually felt like I was being tortured. Um, like I think I said at one point, it feels like I'm being tortured because the hospital bed was uncomfortable. I was in so much pain and this lady was constantly screaming and using bad language, which I do not use. And so listening to that was also just kind of just upsetting. Okay. I'm not saying that it's her fault and I'm, I do feel sorry for her and I especially feel sorry for her because she didn't ever have any family come and visit her and I just keep thinking like, man, that must be so hard having had a stroke and being in a hospital and being confused and not knowing where you were, are and constantly waking up and not having someone with you must be absolutely horrible. And I felt so, so bad for her. But at the same time, I was like, I need her to leave. Like she is, is making my life a million times harder right now. But at the same time, I also am happy that I'm not her because I have my family here. And I don't know, it was just a lot of thoughts going through 
my head. Oh, the other thing about this lady in the other room is that she would listen to the TV on like a really hard, high volume. Like she obviously like couldn't hear very well. So she listened to the TV on this ridiculously high volume. So if she wasn't screaming, the TV at least was at like full volume. And so I think my mom said something um, while she was there and the nurse went into her room and turned the TV down because she would keep the TV on like at all hours of the day, even if she was sleeping, the TV would be on. So the nurse did go in and turn the TV down, which did help a lot, but I still had this lady like constantly yelling. And then I think it was that night that something magical happened. It was they decided to switch rooms around and I was like, why are they doing this? And they took this lady out of my room and just changed rooms and they brought in a new person. There was a new person that had clearly just had surgery and she was clearly in a lot of pain and she would cry out in pain. It was probably a similar surgery to mine because I heard her complaining about her back and they had moved her without permission. She was like screaming in pain. It sounded like she was in like a similar amount of pain to me, but she dealt with it differently. She more dealt with it by screaming and I feel like it takes too much energy to scream, um, which is fine. Like everyone deals with pain differently, but um, she was screaming, but and that was hard to listen to still, but it was nowhere near the amount of like constant screaming and yelling and saying bad words, though she did say bad words when she screamed because she was in that much pain, but it wasn't like sharing the room with this other old lady with the stroke, which was good. And I think I found out later that my mom had said something to the nurses that like this person was torturing me and obviously like probably people are going to get mad that I use the word torture because it's not really torture or whatever, but like that's what I can use to describe it. Anyway, my mom told like the nurses this and they somehow found a way to rearrange the room so that I didn't have to be with the her any longer. And I'm just so incredibly thankful that the hospital was that busy, had so many people, but they found the time and like resources to be able to switch the rooms around so that I was able to sleep that night um, as well as I could. Obviously, I still had the person in the other room yelling and I still had my own pain to deal with, but I actually got, you know, a couple hours of uninterrupted sleep and that was huge for me. The night was still rough. The bed was super uncomfortable. That was like my main complaint was I had so much pain from the bed. I had two IV access points in and one of them had stopped working and the other one was kind of being finicky. So I knew that when the other one stopped working, it would probably be time for me to just like start coming off of the medicine. And so I was getting the nurses ready because I felt like things were taking forever. Whenever I would ask for something, it would take so long. So in my mind, I was kind of understanding why that lady was constantly yelling because she would probably ask for something and it would take so long to get it. And like I said, the hospital was probably just like understaffed, had too many people in it. And I'm not saying it's their fault, but I am saying that whenever I needed something, I like didn't get it. And so I tried to like mention this about how um, I knew that the IV was going to stop working soon and that I needed to start getting on oral medication. And I needed to find something that worked orally in order to go home because I couldn't just keep getting the IV toward all. They also wanted me to come off of it anyway and it was IV so I couldn't go home with it. Um, and so I kept telling the nurses like, can we start trying other medications? Cause the oxycodone isn't working. Then the IV stopped working. I was like, okay, it's time to take it out. Let's just work on the oral stuff. And I was like, you guys need to get me this stuff because everything's gonna wear off soon. And I'm going to be in this intense, severe amount of pain soon. And I just know because I, I know like based on when I get medicine, when I start to feel bad. And I, I, I literally, I can't even tell you like how much I prepared people for this. Like it was hours and hours. I was like, we need to get this straightened out so that I'm not in tons of pain. We need to get ahead of this. I need to take the pain medication before I'm in piles of pain because it is 
absolutely horrible and they like didn't have it ready and I was just like why and they took the IV out I couldn't get the tour at all and then I was sitting there in this intense amount of pain waiting for them to get me some other drug to try and they were like well it's been this many hours and whatever we can't have this but we can have this and but we have to order it and so it takes forever to order it and all I wanted by me giving them all this advanced warning all I wanted was them to have had them order it and have it like approved in my chart so that I was able to get it whenever I could get it and they didn't do that so I was like really annoyed at them for that um, so I called my mom as she was on the way to the hospital and I was basically like in tears because I was in so much pain being like I told them that I needed this and they didn't do it and I was so frustrated and I cry when I'm frustrated like I was just so so mad because I tried to prepare people for this and I felt like they really let me down even though I know they're busy and it's horrible it's probably horrible to say I'm not a nurse I don't know what it's like to be a nurse but I tried so hard to warn them ahead of time. I literally gave them hours and hours and hours of advance notice and it was just so frustrating. Anyway, the physical therapist shows back up again while I'm in pain on the phone with my mom. And she goes, oh, um, um, we need to do all this stuff and if you wanna be able to leave. And I was like, I wanna leave so badly. I need to get this pain under control, but I wanna leave so badly because I really feel like this bed, this hospital bed that I'm in is like making my recovery a million times harder. And I feel like if I was just in my bed at home, I would be able to heal actually a lot, a lot better. And so the physical therapist is like, it looks like you're in a lot of pain because she saw that I was crying and on the phone. She's like, maybe I should come back another time. In my mind, I'm like, you said that yesterday and you never came back. Everything in this hospital takes a million years. No, we are doing this now. I was like, let's do it now. What do you need me to do? And she's like, okay, well, we need to walk to this room and you know a lot of times people do this over several days they get better and better at it and i'm like no we're doing this all today i'm going to pass all of your dumb tests so that i can leave as fast as possible and she was just like okay like just like relax it's gonna like you don't have to pass all the tests today you can stay in the hospital another night um because like they told me i was gonna be in the hospital for three to five days and i was just like i i'm making it three days and i want to be gone <laughs> And so I went with her, I went up, she was like, you need to, how many stairs are in your house? And I told her, and she was like, okay, then you need to go up and down these stairs this many times. And so I did that. And then she was like, you need to practice getting into a car. They had a fake car that you could practice getting into because you need to be able to get into a car to leave. And you need to practice sitting up and down and being able to use a toilet and stuff like that. And so I was like in all of this pain because they didn't give me all the medication that I needed. I think the only thing that I had in me was like the muscle relaxer and like whatever Toradol was left over from the last time they gave it to me in my IV that had like almost, that had basically completely worn off because I was in piles of pain. But doing all of the exercises and doing all the activities kind of was distracting me from it, though it wasn't really because I was still in so much pain, but I was so determined to leave the hospital that I was doing all of these things. <laughs> and this physical therapist is just looking at me like, you don't need to do this right now. Like you can, you can stay in the hospital another night. And I was like, no, I need to get home. I need to get back to my baby. I need to get back to my bed. The other thing that was worrying me was that the hospital was an hour away from my house. So I knew that the car ride was gonna be absolute torture because every bump you can feel when you have a bad back. They started trying to find a pain medication that would work. So then they, they found this other thing that wasn't oxycodone and I can't remember which one it was, but it was something else and it made me like really dizzy, really nauseous made my head like foggy and like hard to think and because it actually did that and made it hard to think and whatever it i feel like it helped the pain a little bit so i could i could tell it was actually doing something whereas the oxycodone didn't even do any of those things it didn't help the pain and it didn't even make my brain foggy like most pain medications do um, but this one did do that and so i think it helped my pain a little bit though i could still tell that i was in pain 
and so then after that they're like not happy that it was causing me so much like nausea and stuff so they wanted to find something else and then they tried morphine and morphine was the one that worked the best for me um i was able to get like pill oral form morphine obviously not the iv and um that worked it still made my mind foggy and hard to think and i absolutely hate taking it so i only take it when i absolutely have to so i, I finally was like okay great we found morphine i'm going to take the morphine with me i have the muscle relaxer i have morphine and there might have been one other thing that i was allowed to take um and so i had all that set and ready to go then i needed some other things to be able to leave i needed a walker because i was using a walker to get around i wouldn't have been able to walk without it basically especially in the beginning i used that thing to help me get out of bed i used that thing to walk around i used that thing to help me sit on a toilet the other thing that i needed was a toilet seat because um um, I needed it to be raised up higher because I couldn't get myself down in a position to sit all the way down on a toilet seat of a regular height. So I needed one something to put on top of the toilet seat to raise it to be able to sit on a toilet. And they were also getting me a shower seat because I thought that I would need that to shower, but I didn't end up using that. I ended up just like putting my walker halfway in the shower and holding onto the walker and showering because sitting was actually harder than standing for me. So then once I got all that stuff, I think like my dad had to go and get it from like the medical supply store and they, they had a walker that they could give me and I got that from them. I was able to finally leave. Um, I don't know what time it was that day, probably like five o'clock or so. And I walked all the way out of the hospital with the walker. Um, they said I could use the wheelchair, but I didn't want that because I didn't want to have to get all the way down in the wheelchair and feel every bump as they pushed me and then get out of the wheelchair. It was really, really hard to walk all that way because I basically had to like, I had to go down an elevator and then I had to walk across like a whole lobby and, and whatever. It was the most that I had ever walked, but I just didn't want to have to sit down and stand back up and I knew that it was going to be hard to get in the car anyway. Um, so I just walked the whole way and then I had to get in the car which was a lot harder than the practice car they had and there was a time while I was trying to get into the car that I thought oh my gosh this might not work I might not be able to get in this car and go home but I cannot tell you I think I've already made it clear that I wanted to go home so bad that it didn't matter and I was very determined that I eventually figured out how to get into the car and it took a lot of weird maneuvering finally figured it out so we got into the car and the car ride was super rough because we were driving from anchorage back to wasilla where we lived and that was an hour and i could feel every bump especially like in the city it was really hard with like stopping at the stoplights and like construction and like the roads aren't like that good because they just aren't there and so the car ride was super rough, but when I finally got home to my bed, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. It was everything that I hoped it would be. And my sister even had like the idea to get us like, it's actually this, like a new comforter and like new um, pillows and stuff so that everything was nice and clean and comfy. And that was really nice. And I just got into my bed and was like, finally, this bed actually has support. The other bed had no support at all. The only benefit of the hospital bed was that you could move it and it was like electric. So you could move it up and down and, and like you could move it up and down off the floor and you could like move the back up so that it would help you. But like there was absolutely no support in the mattress. The mattress, I wouldn't even call a mattress. It was just like this puffy thing and it was horrible. So... When I got into my bed, I like went to sleep. I probably breastfed my baby again and then went to sleep and it felt so good to finally be home. My baby had gotten used to me being in the bed. So while I was at the hospital, um, my parents and my sister who were helping said that they um, would walk her into the room when she was crying and, and whatever, they would walk around the house and she would look at the bed and be like, why isn't my mom in the bed? 
because she got so used to me being in that bed the day that I collapsed on the mountain and had to go to the ER and they found the fracture and all of that. I had been in that bed for so long before the surgery and then um, finally I was back in my spot in my bed. It felt like she was happy. She was able to sleep. Um, we didn't have her sleep with me because we were doing kind of like a co-sleeping thing before that because that's what worked for us because I couldn't obviously get her in and out of a crib. I couldn't even get myself in and out of a bed very well. So um, we didn't have her sleep with us. My sister and my mom would like take turns like sleeping with her at first until eventually um, I was okay enough to have her in bed with me. Um, I needed to like not be on like heavy pain medication so that I was able to be awake and I needed to not be in so much pain where if she like kicked me or something, it would hurt me too bad. And eventually we got to that point and that was nice. I think that my bed helped heal me. The next day after I got home, I showered. I had, like I said, I had the walker partly in the tub. I had my baby brought to me whenever I needed it. Oh, gabapentin was the other thing that they gave me because I was having all this nerve pain and I started getting like increased nerve pain. I think probably like as things were waking up after the surgery, I had like this pain that would go from like my back down into my butt and I still kind of have this weird feeling in my butt that um, a neurosurgeon looked at while, when I came home and he said that one of the screws in my back is really close to a nerve and it probably like is like affecting it and that's what's making like the pain in my butt still happen though I've gotten so used to it now that it doesn't really bother me and it's also gotten better so uh, that was a thing that I was dealing with and so I would I increased my dose of gabapentin and it might have helped maybe a little bit I don't know and then over the next two weeks, I didn't need muscle relaxer or morphine as much. My two-week follow-up was actually at a week and a half, a little bit more than that. And then my plane flight home was actually like right around the, right at the two-week mark. Um, which everyone was like, don't get on a plane until you're recovered enough. And... The only reason I could get on a plane was because my dad had booked first class tickets for me and my mom so that somebody else was with me to help me like stand up and stuff. My dad, my sister, and my baby came with us home, but they were in um, just regular coach. And my husband, the only reason that he didn't come with us was because he still needed to finish out his job and he needed to finished packing up the house. The movers were gonna be coming and like taking all of our stuff and he needed to like drop off his car to be shipped because we were moving back to Virginia. And so he had like three or four more days um, that he had to stay in Alaska before his flight home. And his dad, had, his dad flew out to help him um, with all of that, which was really nice because he was not, obviously not feeling great either with all this stuff going on. So it was nice that somebody, his dad, was able to go and stay with him during that time and help out. So yeah, the only reason I was able to go on a plane was because it was first class. And even then it was still super uncomfortable. What we did was we flew to Denver. Um, the first flight was from Anchorage to Denver. And we stayed, we didn't try to do two flights in one day, so we stayed overnight in Denver. And then the next day we woke up and we flew from Denver to DC. And that plane was like a really big plane. So the first class was better. It had like the lie flat seats. So I was able to adjust stuff like a lot more. So that was actually way more comfortable. On that flight, my dad had splurged and all of us were sitting in first class. Um, so that was like super nice to have everybody. And we were actually facing backwards so that actually helped me a lot that we were facing the other way for some reason like takeoff it was landing that was the real problem that was the most pain on the first flight um landing was a lot easier on my back when i was uh facing backwards and that was actually like the best flight of my life because i had like 
my baby asleep on my chest, breastfeeding, and um, being able to eat like the first class meal was like so fun because I don't really ever get to do that because it's never my first class. Um, so that was just really fun being able to have her. And pe we definitely got like these weird looks having a baby in first class. Especially on the first flight, we were right in front of this like old couple that was like scoffing at us because my mom would like go back and go get her if she needed to breastfeed. So she, we had her while we were landing because it's easy to have them breastfeed while they we land so that it doesn't hurt their ears. And this old couple was like being like, oh, they have this baby, like why are they doing that? Why do they have a baby in first class? Meanwhile, my baby was being a perfect angel making absolutely no noise and being more polite than them so i don't know what their problem was with her but for some reason they didn't like that we had a baby in first class and on the next flight again she was perfect we didn't have any weird looks on that flight people were kind of like yeah babies are allowed to be in first class too hopefully q doesn't wake up my baby then when i got home i was able to meet with my oncologist in virginia and start treatment and I have vlogs all about that so if you're interested in that go check those out but yeah that was the story of my back surgery and it was a crazy one honestly I don't want to ever have to repeat it some of the worst pain ever yeah if you have any questions leave them in the comments I'm sure I'm gonna get roasted for being like ungrateful for whatever um, but I'm just here trying to explain my story and that is the story so thanks so much for watching subscribe if you want and yeah that's all bye